Open University. Class, greetings. Visual reason. Visual reason. That's kind of what I'm thinking about today. Or it might be something else when I change the, the title, if I extrapolate and improvise my way to some other topic. But I think it's... Um, what I'm thinking about today is, uh, for instance, the fact that I, I want to go to design.com, which is a design site, um, very visual, uh, with lavish and optimistic photographs of people's spaces and people's mind fruit, <laughs> their, their brain children, um, their houses and their environments. Uh, uh, but it's not just any people, it's people who are art school trained, who are visual professionals, who are architects, designers, commercial creatives of various types. And I have... Largely, I have respect for that class, that creative class of people. Uh, I'm a sort of fellow traveller with them. I didn't go to art school myself, but I, I have visited and taught in art schools or, or done studio visits in art schools, hung out with a lot of art students in my time. And um, generally, I trust them. I think they can, I can see why they seem cloying to certain people. There's a kind of cosmopolitan elite class of privileged people who often work for the super rich to make a sort of ideal private space. You know, what people are showing mostly on Dazeen is um, private spaces which are à l'abri de, as you would say in France. Um, they're sort of uh, sheltered from the public space, which is increasingly problematical uh, and increasingly irrational. So I suppose what I'm trying to think about is is, is the fact that I turn to Dazeen as a kind of antidote to the news pages, which are mostly about this very irrational individual who's in the White House just now and who has terrible taste. Uh, he's, uh, visually, he's un unreasonable and irrational. Um, intellectually, he's also unreasonable and irrational. But I wonder if those two things are connected. This is something, a, a perennial question for me. I remember being told at university I had a went to a party and there was a philosophy lecturer there and I'd been going to some extracurricular philosophy classes and I said to him, do you think that uh, there can be a purely aesthetic basis for philosophy? In other words, can one arrive at answers to the big questions equipped only with, with aesthetics or mainly with aesthetics? And he said, no, that's a bad mistake. <laughs> but it is kind of my tendency to want to do that. I want to uh, have an aesthetic outlook and I trust people, perhaps wrongly, uh, who seem aesthetically correct in some way, aesthetically advanced in some way. Um, there is no correct, there's no right and wrong in aesthetics, and uh, of course it's very difficult to define why someone is aesthetically right or wrong, or perhaps halfway between the two, or perhaps a provocateur, and therefore um, doing an interesting performative thing with, uh, with wrongness, which might turn into a new rightness. There are all these games going on. Um, when I look at Dazeen, I recognize my own kind, um, but I also feel a certain revulsion from the, the smugness and cosmopolitan elitism of that group. I was looking, if you look at the current main page for Dazeen, there's an Israeli couple who've built a breeze block house overlooking fruit and orchards and... Uh, um, it looks a bit like a compound with some nice... Certainly the exterior would look more like a compound or a bit like that awful American embassy that was built in Berlin that looks like a sort of barbed wire fortress in the centre of Berlin. Um, and the comments are all very reasonable. People saying it's nice. and um, Nobody makes any political point. I guess they don't go there because politics is for the newspapers and Dazeen is a kind of antidote to the newspapers. Similarly, um, there's a, <clears throat> I watched a video associated with a piece about a, a London couple of designers who bought, who acquired in their language, a very small coach house, a uh, tiny thing like 20 meters squared, and remade it with uh, space-saving ideas and then 
had an exhibition in a shop which I recognise as uh, a design shop in Clerkenwell, which is actually in the same building as um, Pet Shop Boy, Chris Lowe's apartment. And uh, there's an opening and everyone's sort of, you know, dressed in their kind of nice expensive London clothes with their expensive trainers and things. There's a certain kind of London look the creative class has, which is kind of repellent on, a, on some level to me. Like um, the, the sports shoes seem to suggest that you're, uh, there's a certain social Darwinism that you can be faster and uh, more agile and, and fit and trim and slim than those bozos out there. Um, superiority itself is problematical. I think this, this is, there's a dog whistle element to a lot of these things. Yeah, I was going to say about that London couple that in their video, they never once mention the fact that it's high rents that make small spaces so attractive. They, they're presenting micro-living, micro-houses as a thing and saying, oh, it's much easier to clean because there's less there. And, you know, we, we're, we clever designers can shrink everything down to a very tiny space. They never once say, why is it that uh, uh, um, profiteering landlords, for instance, insist on making the London rents so high or there's an overheated property market, which is the result of political decisions over the decades in Britain, the emphasis on private property for a lucky minority, or perhaps the Thatcherite idea of expanding that by selling the public housing stock to private owners. All the rest of it, this whole history of how we got to this situation where you need a micro-home is kind of set aside, and there's simply this utopian idea. It's, it's, it's a kind of given, a law of nature, that uh, cities like London and Paris need... Um, concentrated micro spaces, Japan as well, these highly capitalist countries. There is a reason that they, that they have to shrink their living space. But that, it's not really designer's job to go into the reason, but it is there like a dog whistle. It's there like a, um, a kind of a message which we all know is the reason. Um, and basically... Perhaps life is too short to actually go into... The, I, I mean, there's the Joseph Boyce solution, which is that everybody is an artist, and artists are political, and that he went into the parliament and tried to see it as an artwork to change the political course of Germany. I'm personally um, not very attracted to that, because I think it, it, it means a dilution of the vision of artists, and it means um, a wasting of the time, basically, of, of artists if they become politicians. Their values are probably not going to... Um, ever catch on. It's clearly a way for affluent inner city cosmopolitan people to signal to each other their superiority or their common values. Fine, and, you know, it's tribal in that sense. Everybody's kind of tribal, especially these days. It's much more schismatic and tribal across the whole of society. Um, sometimes one has problems with one own, one's own tribe and uh, small differences become big. And um, I, I kind of suffer a bit from that in that I I'm uh, slightly repulsed by some of the values of the London creative class, for instance. Or So I'm happier to look at... Uh, there's a feature, um, 10 top architectural practices in London, and then they also do one 10 top architectural practices in Paris. I, I prefer the Paris one. Uh, the London offices... It's funny because architectural practices, are they're kind of offices like any other, but, but much more chic and kind of there's more thought gone into the premises um, and uh, I actually found recently, found out that Tadao Ando, who's Japan's leading architect perhaps in his 70s now, he's about 75 he has his office here in Osaka I haven't yet tracked down exactly where it is but he has a lot of projects in Osaka a lot of famous church and a famous micro house actually in Sumiyoshi district, which I haven't actually seen, um, it's just a very plain frontage, a little box like concrete entrance and the house is hidden behind that, and it's tiny. And it's sort of this kind of zen in concrete idea that Tadao Ando tends to do. He's not, not my favourite architect. Very excited, by the way, to see that when I go back to London, there is this big exhibition at the Barbican of Japanese small houses. That'll be on until late June, so I'll get a chance to see it at least once. And uh, the Barbican, one of my favourite places in London, uh, a lot of concrete there. Um, my brother actually has an apartment in the Barbican. Very tiny one, so again, a micro house, a micro space. But, and I used to live right next to the Barbican on Long Lane, 
uh, just that was my last London address actually. Um, so it'll probably give British people the impression of visitors to that exhibition, the impression that Japan is full of these very well designed micro houses. It's actually not, it's full of very bland houses. Actually they start off when they're being built as rather beautiful because they're built with cedar construction but then they're clad with these awful ugly utilitarian materials and generally shape-wise are not very interesting. But um, yeah, so Tadao Ando is here in Osaka and, and there's, um, there's a photo essay you can find on his uh, the interior of his design office and of course it's a huge concrete uh, bunker or multi-levels multi with kind of concrete staircases, quite dramatic inside. Um, slightly fusty because he's getting on in age and somehow you, you lose the fraîcheur, the freshness as you get older, in some cases. Um, perhaps it's not, not the same with Rem Koolhaas. Um, so these pictures of uh, London design offices, it's people sitting staring at computers. This is another of my problems with this architectural thing is that we're so invested in the digital now that it's actually kind of more important what you do in your software, um, like me making this video you know, in software, than what you do with your living space. Or, or rather, it's, a, it's a, a balance you have to make. And uh, I make a point of trying to just put the computers aside for a while, at least every day, and go out onto the terrace with a cup of coffee and a book. So that's what I was doing this morning with, um, with Virginia Woolf's essays. And uh, I find that since you're reading text on screen, but it's kind of low-grade text, it's much better to read kind of quality text in a handheld device called a book. Um, sorry for the noise. There's somebody selling something outside. The noise of the street enters the house. Um, it's made to link, put it. So uh, the other, the thing I really liked actually on Design this morning was a Paris apartment which has been reconfigured. It's a top apartment so it's got the zinc, um, a bit like where I lived in, in um, Long Lane in London actually, that was also a roof apartment and it, so it was sort of zinc covered. Um, in that Parisian style, um, with the windows punched out through the zinc, and um, but this one in Paris is uh, they've made it made the apartment more open plan, and they put in these sort of zigzaggy, angular bookshelves, and books of course do furnish a room as they say, and that's uh, so visually I am assured when I look at that apartment that these people are on the same page as me. They're into books. They're they they live in Paris in a sort of 19th century apartment which has been refurbished and made visually rational. It's been made rational. This, this is what, see, you have, if you ask what do architects do in their offices, what are they offering their clients when you can simply have a building manager to make a building or you can refurbish your place yourself, you know. Um, I think they're offering a kind of, the idea of not just rationality but a, a kind of and not just superiority, because it's obviously going to look better than your neighbor's apartment, but kind of the idea that uh, there is a world of uh, cleverness and good intentions and uh, elegance and beauty and refinement, which you can at least stretch around your public space, even uh, your private space rather, than, even if it's not applying in public space, because public space is generally dominated by politicians who don't, although they have vast resources at their disposal, they don't tend to have the same kind of rationality. They operate in a more dirty environment. It's not just a question of making a, an individual pact with an individual patron or consumer, um, the proprietor of a space who wants you to do something advanced with it, something progressive with it. You have to use all these words. There is no aesthetic progression uh, there are simply aesthetic tastes and of course they go in and out of fashion like everything else and they're seen by some people as, as awful. I mean if you look at pretty much any public discussion of something like the Pritzker Prize, the Architecture Prize or the Turner Prize for that matter in newspapers, most people are, are alienated and actually deeply offended, weirdly enough, by these aesthetic values which apply to these prizes and to the metropolitan, cosmopolitan elites who tend to use the prizes to spread their value systems. Um, a note uh, on those London designers who made the tiny coach house, uh, which I, did, I didn't like aesthetically that much, but um, they're both uh, 
immigrants uh, to Britain. Neither of them actually British. Uh, one of them's Danish, the other I couldn't identify where he's from, but definitely not an English language as a first language speaker. So uh, that's very common in this world. It's a cosmopolitan world. And you have to say about the visual world that its rationality, its logic is an international one. The difference, I was talking the other day about how the, um, uh, the Sleaford mods don't translate very well because who outside Britain is going to buy a record called BHS? We're going down like BHS. It's a very local reference. It's provincial. And words and references like that tend to tie you into the provincial to a particular country. And of course, we're all supposed to be now tied in more to the provincial and more you know, fixated on our own little national dramas rather than the international and the idea of an, a progressivism which applies internationally which is, of course, the root idea of Marxism, um, workers of the world unite, but also the root idea of the cosmopolitan liberalism, which is kind of, in a sense, the alternative, but also companion to Marxism, cultural Marxism, as it's called. I'm a cultural Marxist, absolutely, all the way down the line, um, which is the idea that there is a uni or universal human rights, for instance, there should be universal organizations like courts of justice and all the rest of it, which uh, guarantee a certain liberal cosmopolitan order uh, and, the, and that boundaries should fall internationally, shouldn't, or certainly shouldn't be overrated. It shouldn't be the be-all and end-all of our political process. Just think, we're now, we have such big problems in the world and we're focusing on borders. Why do we love borders so much? Well, it's partly, I suppose you could use the metaphor of the design apartment. If I have walls, borders around my apartment, I can do something with it, which protects it from what I perceive to be a hostile environment outside, not just the weather, the cold, um, but also a sense of danger. Not, I don't trust other people. They would steal what I have. You know, um, There is inequality out there, and therefore, if I'm slightly advantaged, I, I fear that... Uh, the poor people will come in and maybe justifiably steal what I have, steal the excess which I have, which I've somehow hoarded up because of, uh, because of um, the unjust system which allows me to take their surplus value. So I suppose I could understand nationalism as a kind of disease writ large, disease, the idea that uh, utopia is only possible in micro-bubbles, in little exceptional zones, or only um, in the minds of an elite, advanced, intelligent class, and uh, that inequality somehow is at the very roots of that, the existence of that class. So these are the kind of things I'm thinking about. You know, um, how many minutes have I done? Done 18 minutes there. Um, try and make it 20 because uh, all these are 20 minutes. Yeah, uh, um, I think in the last decade I, I, I actually took people seriously if they were just screen names and just text on a page. And then later I realized that I, if I'd simply seen those people and seen what, what their aesthetic style was, as I'm showing myself to you now, I think it's important for my words to, to have a certain weight, or perhaps they're stripped of weight, I don't know, by the fact that you can see me speaking. You can hear my accent. You have a huge amount of information from a visual essay, a video essay, that you wouldn't have from text on a page with somebody using an avatar, a screen name, a handle. I'm being sincere as I speak to you now. Uh, you can possibly tell things from my voice, from my accent, uh, from my vocabulary, from my sentence structure, from my clothes, from my posture, the way my body shape, you know, the fact that I'm this kind of a thinic type, although a little fatter than I would like to be, to be perfectly honest. I've got a tiny little beer belly kind of thing, which uh, comes and goes, but... Um, I feel in my mind, anyway, I'm a thin person, and I think with a thin person's thought process, which is uh, ascetic. Ascetic and also elegant. Uh, so a lot of these architecture projects on design or elsewhere are ascetic, but also elegant, just as I am. And uh, the Japanese are also, I think, possibly, they think with my body type. So all these things, which, in a sense, you're, are, are at odds, at variance with the idea of a universal sympathies and, and human rights. In a sense, justice justice is always portrayed as having this blindfold so that she won't be prejudiced by looking at someone's body type or their colour, the colour of their skin, whatever. But of course we do, we are prejudiced and we are situated. And when we show ourselves, for instance, in front of a camera, 
we are actually uh, revealing our situatedness. And that has an upside and a downside. Um, perhaps you'll simply say, a lot of people watching this video, this video will get a few hundred views, but a lot of people out there, if they were forced to watch it, if it was brought to their attention by some kind of linking or you know, YouTube chooses it as a featured video or whatever, not that that's going to happen, would, would actually be uh, actively offended by A, what I'm saying, but B, who I am, a product of a certain system um, and also of a certain sensibility, uh, which a lot of people would um, take offence at, possibly because of the dog whistle elements, you know, or, or their kind of paranoid associations of this with, a, with a, an imagined condemnation of their lifestyle, which might be, you know, really what I would do if I saw their lifestyle. I think it's... Um, <clears throat> There are some problems and the contradictions in that that uh, you you kind of want you want to justify the design lifestyle as a a universally valid kind of aesthetic, but at the same time it's very situated and it's very um, but because it's non-verbal, it's a little bit easier to conceal the prejudices which are built into that worldview. I don't know. It's a clutter, a clustered clutter of ideas there. Um, perhaps you could unpick it in your own way. Leave a comment, subscribe. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Just uh, think on. Open University.